So this is an example that shows some ideas about where we're hoping to go with some of these techniques. It is very much in, in progress. Um, uh, we're, we're just in the starting stages of analysis. But the general approaches we're seeking to take are broadly <coughs> applicable in terms of being able to be used for other studies, particularly other studies using larger scale data sources such as uh, we can collect with Ethica. Specifically, what I'm wanting to talk about here is, is leveraging Ethica as a data collection tool, system science methods and data science analysis methods in the form of machine learning and, and, and uh, syst uh, system science approaches to understand impacts of service dogs on opioid-dependent veterans who suffer from PTSD. Okay. Um, this is work which uh, is conducted with a wide variety of partners. Uh, Colleen Dell is uh, the other primary investigator in this project, but it's also a close partnership with uh, Adiamas, which is a service dog training nonprofit focused on veterans and in informing um, uh, and, and benefiting veterans. Through, through the use of service dogs? Would any of my students be able to get me a bit of hot water in, 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 in uh, the other team? Thanks. And, uh, and it's uh, further a uh, collaboration that includes um, partners from BC Institute of Technology, the RCMP, University of Virginia, et cetera. Thanks a ton. It's a modified case crossover trial in the sense that we have people joining it who who um, uh, start and at the start they don't have a fully trained service dog. Uh, the, the dog is new, the person is new, and then the dog gets trained over time. So by the end they have a, a dog that uh, is fully trained to recognize their symptoms of stress to intervene in stress um, uh, interventions for them. Uh, this study is is nine and a half months in duration. Thanks a ton, sorry for the trouble. Uh, it is a small N. The hope is there to expand this to 30, um, uh, but right now it started at a small number of, of six. Christine is, uh, um, can monitor when that Health Canada application that we, I mean, maybe you can ask Colleen if that's still getting considered for 30. Uh, th there's a, an application to Health Canada to explore, to, ex to expand the number of, of, of service dogs to 30 and veterans. And I'm not sure where that's at proposal wise. It's, it's still waiting. waiting. Yeah. Um, so this is leveraging wearables and phone sensors. You could see uh, this, uh, one of the veterans here, he's wearing a wristband, but um, the dog is also wearing a something called a Bluetooth beacon, which Alex will be demonstrating tomorrow as his health allows. Uh, and that tracks the proximity of the veteran to their specific dog. Uh, the, the veteran's phone also can detect the presence of other dogs. And we're seeking to understand the dog's impacts on a variety of outcomes, including flashbacks on the part of the veteran, emotional support, social contact and isolation, physical activity, and, and substance use. But I'd like to put this into to a broader context as well. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, often within the sphere of health and, and other aspects of, of, of human behavior and wellness, we seek to intervene according to approaches that manifest effects across a variety of different pathways, generative pathways by which they work. An example would be a, a, a uh, intervention focused on moving people from a uh, lower income neighborhood to a mixed income neighborhood. Um, I think of, for example, the moving to opportunity study in the US. And within such studies, Traditionally, it's been hard to resolve the different ways in which the original intervention affected things. 
Um, for example, moving to opportunity has been noted for lowering obesity rates among teenage girls, uh, lowering the risks of pro-criminal involvement, and enhancing likelihood of high school graduation. But in boys, it's been noted that obesity levels were not meaningfully decreased. Pro-criminal involvement actually worsened, which is interesting, for, for the high school boys involved. Um, and I'm not sure about likelihood of high school graduation, but I don't think it was an improvement, um, possibly worse. And hypotheses have been advanced for why that is. But the survey instruments are sufficiently coarse that it's not entirely clear. Um, based on self-reporting on surveys, say once a quarter or once every half year, it's hard to reliably address the different ways in which things might have changed. For example, that initial intervention might have changed, might have improved teenage girls' obesity levels, lowered them by exposing them to greater availability of ball courts, recreational space, um, which promoted moderate to vigorous physical activity, lowered BMI, and thereby phys uh, obesity levels. Alternatively, it may be that by living in a new neighborhood, the primary determiner was instead through matters of perceived safety, that they perceived the, the neighborhood of being safer. Uh, the sidewalks were, um, uh, were less daunting at night, et cetera, and therefore more moderate to vigorous physical activity or lower sedentary behavior ensued, which lowers obesity levels. In other cases, it may have been predominantly mediated by walkability. Um, maybe the sidewalks in their old neighborhood were crumbling and the new neighborhood with improved sidewalks, they have lower sedentary behavior, they can be out and about in the neighborhood better, which lowers obesity levels. Others yet have hypothesized that, wait, uh, maybe it's healthy food availability that has lowered BMI levels. Maybe the girls have access and their families have access to to a fresh fruit market, a, a fresh fruit uh, food markets where they can purchase uh, produce, um, uh, which are less stocked than the with um, uh, preserved foods, uh, high sugar, high fat, that are characteristic of convenience stores. Maybe it's the availability of healthy foods in the neighborhood that has led to a healthier diet, thereby lower BMI and, and, and improved obesity levels. Yet others have hypothesized about the strength of, of, of familial um, networks. Maybe the girls are spending more time at home eating eating good cooking from home rather than eating out with their old social networks. Maybe the primary difference is, is not one that the neighborhood is better, but the kids are spending more time at home because their social networks from the old neighborhood are gone. And therefore, they spend more time with their family. The point here is there's many hypotheses for, for why we see the changes uh, recorded in a coarse-grained way from a study like Moving to Opportunity. And the types of questions that are asked on s traditional survey instruments are sufficiently coarse, occurring once a quarter or once, uh, once every half year, and self-reporting sufficiently dicey enough with respect to these factors that it's hard to trust reliable knowledge coming from a study like that about what really changed, why we saw the changes we did. Especially when it comes to things like pro-criminal involvement increase on the part of boys. You know, why is it that that had? It's, it's hard, to, hard to check hypotheses like they're spending time in the old hood away from parental supervision and they get in trouble there more readily because the parents aren't around. Recognizing this was much of the motivation for our approach for this study with, uh, with Colleen Dell and with uh, service dogs um, for opioid dependent veterans. We are interested in understanding the impacts of highly trained service dogs and the well being of, of veterans with PTSD opioid use disorder, um, but also what are the primary pathways by which these uh, influences are felt, these impacts are felt, and are they a particular pathways whose differential impacts can explain differences? among participant outcomes. Are there particular pathways 
which are really active in in explaining why some veterans benefit more than others. Like the moving to opportunity case, we're faced here with an intervention, provision of service dogs to veterans, which has many generative pathways to possible effect. Okay, um, so if we think about pairing a veteran with a trained service dog, and we think about the impact on their sense of well-being, or their risk of suicidal ideation, or in their substance use, in this case um, with a particular interest in opioid use, there's many possible pathways to affect here. One is, well, th th the veteran being paired with the service dog, it might be the obvious one, they're getting a certain degree of companionship for the dog, which no doubt for many veterans provides a keenly needed companion in life, which leads to an enhanced sense of well-being. However, the dog has a much more pervasive effect. It, it may add to a veteran's life, which has otherwise been somewhat disordered and, and tumultuous, it may add a certain structure, a certain regularity to their life because the dog's needs to go out and the dog's needs to, uh, to engage with, um, with the outside are, 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 are regular. And it may be that the veteran is has to spend time at home and with the dog to address those needs. And that added structure to their life may itself contribute some to their sense of well-being and less, less chance of a, of a flashback and enhance sleep, very importantly. In other cases, that the emphasis might be thought to, to rely on time outside of home. The fact that drawing the veteran outside of home, first of all, there's less sedentary behavior there's more physical activity. That leads to greater physical health and a greater sense of well-being and greater physical activity contributing to a sense of well-being directly. But that time outside of the home with the dog can also mean greater amounts of social contact with other people in the neighborhood. One of the features of the dog that I didn't realize until I got involved with the study is the degree to which a dog can draw veterans into contact with others. And allow that veteran to choose how close to make that contact or how distant through use of the leash and so on. Um, so in this case, there, there's a hypothesized pathway through social contact with others in the neighborhood that lead to a sense of belonging, a sense of companionship, a sense of knowing others, a sense of, of balance in one's life that lowers the sense of alienation and that contributes in turn to reductions in opioid use and should be shown here clearly for some reason it's not, sense of well-being. In other cases yet, we might hypothesize that actually what's, what's uh, being, being realized here is the time outside of home is an important part of that is with this, the other veterans who have dogs themselves. There are these regular meetings with other veterans as part of the training. Maybe that leads to lower sense of ideation. Finally, a sense of alienation. Finally, it's to be emphasized, these dogs that we're dealing with are not merely companion animals, although they are that. They're highly, highly trained dogs. There's a binder of, of training materials, about yay thick, that they go through to train the service dog to not only know it roughly its owner's needs physically, but to recognize the specific symptoms of stress in that owner to recognize the sign of how this particular veteran shows stress, whether it's by, by um, sitting rock, rock still, or whether it's by uh, legs shaking, or whether it's by slight moans, um, to recognize how that veteran feels stress. And dogs are highly attuned to this sort of phenomenon. And a highly trained service dog, one that's honed to recognize this and not be distracted by other things, can be extremely effective in terms of interrupting stressful events for the veteran or stressful feelings for the veteran. And critically, for veterans who suffer PTSD, it is trained to interrupt flashbacks by that veteran. So when the veteran is sleeping and the veteran encounters a flashback, it's trained to recognize it and interrupt it. And interrupt it before it becomes overwhelmingly physical, visceral in a way that casts a shadow 
on subsequent days. Now, these are all different possible impacts, ladies and gentlemen, of introducing a service dog to this veteran flood. Ladies and gentlemen, we have here a tangled system. It's, it's not just a neat thing where the service dog leads to greater companionship, and we ask those companionship lead to greater well-being. Far from that, what we're seeing is effects along multiple pathways that are plausible. And we'd like to know what, which of those pathways are making the greatest effect. How can we amplify those even better? Perhaps when we see differential outcomes among, among veterans, where do we fall short with a veteran that, that did not benefit much from it so we can know how to be less vulnerable to that less time, that we can design an intervention that's more effective? We're dealing in short here with a complex system, system with multiple tangled pathways to effect. And we need the tools that are responsive, ladies and gentlemen, to that challenge. Now, we're seeking to leverage here mobile data collection. Data collection with smartphones, yes, Ethica, but also with wearables, part, which can also come through Ethica and be linked in and Ethica databases. But we're also leveraging beyond the, the Fitbit that each veteran wears and flows into, has data flowing into Ethica, we're also leveraging wearable devices on the dogs. So specifically the dogs carry beacons. Beacons which indicate their degree of time that they spend with the veterans. And we're seeking in our analysis of this to use to use the understanding that comes from the study to build theory, to build up understanding, um, and to recognize patterns of effect that we didn't previously recognize, and eventually perhaps to explicate theory. In a course that some of the students here have taken for me, my colleague Ross Hammond likes to distinguish uh, in his opening lecture between models that inform and build theory those focus on, on helping us engage in, in grounded theory building versus those that explicate theory. And we hope to initiate at this level, but eventually get to theory explication. So what are we using for this? Well, we're using Ethica. Ethica has a study associated with this, running, as you know, on Android and iPhone smartphones. Um, uh, the veterans are carrying it on their smartphones. Um, and uh, it's it's collecting diverse sensor modalities, um, uh, things like physical activity and things like their location, their proximity to the dog, um, and playing a role, a broader role with, um, in terms of both survey data collection and sensor-based. Now, naturally with any study, as you've seen, you can define surveys, and this study makes heavy use of survey instruments delivered on the phone, these so-called ecological momentary assessments. These little assessments, assessments pop during the day to inquire with the veteran about their situation. Um, each, uh, as you know, each study can feature here its own little interface, and this study is no exception. And we have these surveys triggered by things such as their time with the dog. So when they haven't been with the dog for a long time, we can record barriers to that that they report. We can ask them, has there been a barrier for the, and you in, uh, spending time with the dog such that you haven't encountered it um, within the past, you know, eight or 12 hours. Or similarly, when they are with the dog, we can ask them questions in the freshness of the moment that minimize recall bias about their feelings towards the dog. So we have these dogs, and you notice these dogs are outfitted with collars, both martingale and, uh, and uh, collars based on uh, uh, leather working, which, which hold this beacon. Um, and that beacon plays a very important role here because it helps us track how much time the veteran is spending with the dog, trigger questions based on that, but also use it as an explanatory variable in terms of understanding outcomes. 
how much time after all is this veteran spending with the dog compared to this other one? And could that explain some of the difference we see in terms of the outcomes between them? So we're using sensors based on the wearables, the Fitbit, it's uh, Fitbit Alta HR, I think. It's a, it's a heart rate uh, measuring Fitbit that also measures uh, physical activity through accelerometry uh, and um, measures uh, uh, step count. Uh, we're measuring things through the phone. We're measuring social contacts with other veterans in the study using using these uh, the beacons to discover when they're nearby other other dogs. We could provide beacons to put in their wallets if we want to discover veteran veteran contact. We're tracking location with the phone, how much time they're spending at home, seeing if the presence dog helped bring them from being a shut in to bring them out more and track their situation outside. And um, we're tracking uh, distance uh, between the, the, the um, veteran and the dog. Um, Ethica serves as a Fitbit for some of the, uh, the Fitbit, uh, excuse me, as a conduit for some of the Fitbit data, but it also serves as a way of asking these micro questions. Um, so uh, these dogs are out here with these beacons. Uh, properly configured, these beacons should last about two years. So they, they sort of send out pings over the course of these two years. And we have these studies. These are part of the Ethica interface. Uh, you know, things like accelerometer, linear acceleration, gyroscope, um, uh, the survey responses, uh, pedometer, accelerometer, GPS, et cetera. Um, so we can track a bunch of things automatically here. Um, with the uh, Bluetooth beacon signal strength, how, how, how strong that signal is, this is something Young Chen mentioned in her presentation, something called RSSI or BRSSI. Um, basically it can track how, how far, it's a proxy for how far are they to that beacon. If the signal strength is really strong, they're probably very close to the dog maybe a meter away. By contrast, if it's, if it's a weak signal, the dog may be you know, 10 meters away. And you can actually tune the beacon to, to, to have certain ranges that it supports in terms of, of the uh, strength of signal. Um, it's not perfect in measuring this, but it's pretty darn good. And certainly better than self-report once every three months or something like that. Um, GPS accuracy and availability and charging, just like with Yang Chen's study, we can track time spent outside or inside. We get a sense, are they likely out of their house if they've been drawn out? In terms of contact with other Bluetooth beacons, for other dogs, how much time they're spending with other veterans and, by extension, their dogs. We could actually track veteran-to-veteran -veteran contacts if we wanted to, um, but uh, uh, we, we chose to do it with just the Bluetooth beacons and the dogs. Um, GPS location, um, we can get an understanding of where they're spending their time geographically. Accelerometry and heart rate, we can understand something about their physical activity and sedentary behavior. Uh, with sleep length and regularity as picked up by the Fitbit, we can estimate something about sleep quality. It's not perfect, but it gets us much further than we would get otherwise and we can cross-link it to data from the phone about when the phone's being used using methods like Tina has worked with to determine what their likely sleep, sleep schedule is. And finally, accelerometry, heart rate, and time, we can get some indication when they might have encountered a flashback. And of course, we could ask about that on the phone as well. So there are some self-reporting that we ask about. Uh, Human-dog bond, quality of life, PTSD symptoms, substance use, emotional intelligence, and reason for separation by the dog. Um, there's also interviewing going on in a mixed methods type study with qualitative study asking about perceptions of, of um, technical skill, the bond with the animal, the function, their functioning and depression, suicidal ideation, and physical health for the veteran. So what this gives us is a picture over time of the veteran's life. It gives us this higher resolution picture of what's going on over time. This picture doesn't always pop out on its own, but it pops out 
once we engage in the analysis with it using these sort of data science techniques we're talking about this week. So we can know when the dog arrived, when they go through training with the dog, we can recognize when there are instances of poor sleep and based on their time with the dog, we hope those instances of poor sleep reduce. We can see when they're engaged with others socially and when dogs interrupt flashback episodes and uh, when they, the veteran engages in moderate to vigorous physical activity, which we hope will increase over the course of this time. And we can sense the degree of sedentary behavior on the part of the veteran, which I've tried to illustrate in terms of these colors here. I will note that one of my students, two of my students, Alex Dumay, who we you all have met, um, and hopefully we'll meet again tomorrow, um, giving a talk, but also another student, Iman Jamali, um, are trying to work on a system that automatically creates these graphs from Ethica based on knitting together the different data picked up by Ethica when they answered certain surveys, when in terms of um, measurements, say of step counts and show you that levels show when, when uh, step counts exceed a certain uh, feature or when they encountered a dog or what have you. So these timelines, I think, are useful things to think about. So, you know, our hope here is to use this data, not just in a disconnected, you know, data crunching sort of way, but to inform theory. And inform theory addressing these different pathways to effect. People talk sometimes, misguidedly in my view, about about data science taking us into a world of post-theory science. I don't believe it. It hasn't happened before when people have predicted it, and I don't believe it's going to happen now. There is some strength to recognizing empirical regularities that as of yet lack theory, but theory is going to remain important. And I argue in this, in this particular endeavor, we can greatly enrich theory by tying it down to empirical data. So if we have these multiple pathways to effect, of which I spoke before, I would note that traditionally, with traditional instruments, we have sort of a blunt instrument for measuring these things. We can ask you know, uh, about people's sense of well-being, but to avoid being burdensome, only do so with paper instruments occasionally or with phone calls. We can assess physical health and ask people about, say, how much physical activity that they get but there's big bounds around those, error bounds around them. We can ask how much time they're spending with the dog or how much companionship they feel. But again, typically, typically it's coarse-grained um, time-wise. And their time spent with this, with the dog, it's pretty variable what they, might, uh, what they might estimate, judging from some of our other work that we've done, where people estimate amount of time spent with different parties. When we have this sort of finer grained ability to measure things with smartphones, we can actually start to pin down things across a larger number of different pathways here. More than that, we can pin it down in a high velocity sort of way. So we can measure, using measures such as entropy, how much predictability there is in the veteran's life before they have a highly trained service dog, say in the opening week of the study versus once the dog is introduced. We have entropy measures that can that give, a, give a, a number to estimate predictability. We can look at the recurrences of sleep as measured by a Fitbit and is cross-checked by data from the phone. If they're checking their phone in the middle of the night, they're probably not asleep. And we can use the two together to give a, a better understanding we could get through any one measure. We can measure their time outside their, the home, how much sedentary behavior they're getting using physical measures based on well-mounted uh, wristwatches. We can assess their moderate and vigorous physical activity. We can assess their, their degree of companionship for the dog in the moment with questionnaires being asked to them and their sense of companionship. We can look how much time they're spending outside the home and how much contact with the other service dog community. And we can at least ask about contact with others. And we can try to recognize 
through the combination of heart rate and accelerometry and proximity to the dog, et cetera, as well as through self-report aspects of, of flashbacks, both uninterrupted and, and interrupted. These are important things, and we can pin them down more precisely using the types of information we can gather from Fitbits and from smartphones and from the beacons on the dogs to pin down what's going on across these pathways. Not once every three months, not once every six months, but many, many times a day. And the picture we weave together is indeed much richer than the picture we get with three-month check-ins or six-month check-ins. So this focus on generative pathways, on a particular mechanisms to effect of an intervention, is, I think, an important one. It's one we can extend to many interventions. And it's one that we can use to recognize, even if an intervention is not as efficacious as we wish, we can recognize where it might be falling short, which pathways did it successfully nudge. Perhaps the dogs were highly successful in enhancing companionship, enhancing sedentary behavior, but not much moderate to vigorous physical activity. Maybe they added structure to the life, but they fell short in bringing people in social contact with other veterans. And by knowing that, we might be able to design a more responsive study. It's not that this intervention, say, fails, if that's the case. It's a success for learning if we can take what we learned from this, figure out which pathways we fell short, and figure out an intervention that will help address that shortcoming. And that's much of what we're seeking to do here, but it's what, much of what we're seeking to do for other studies. Think back to my example of that moving to opportunity study as well, which I'll return to. Here we can use measurements at many points within the system at, at a fine-grained level to give a sense of just how big the changes are before and after a crossover to intervention. And, you know, if we were to couple this with a randomization, for example, uh, it can help us distinguish which pathways are major drivers and primary reasons for lack of intervention success. And with tools such as CCM to identify causal drivers for patterns which are measured at a high resolution level, say between sleep levels for each successive night and time with dog, we could start to actually recognize causal linkages even outside the context of randomization. So we're aiming here to engage in a process of theory building. And part of that is the evidence from this. Part of that is, is creating models, creating models that depict the broader status of the veterans circulation and, and, life, and life spaces and their day-to-day their -day functioning. I won't go into this much. You've already heard my spiel on, on models as thinking tools, models to help sharpen our thinking models as learning prostheses that help us learn more quickly, not as crystal balls that are either correct or, or deserve to be shattered. And really what we're trying to do is to, to build up theory about what's really going on here uh, following the intervention and to be able to, to, to ground that theory in evidence. And when we have evidence, not just from, from occasional uh, pathways, but for many pathways, it can ground our understanding much better. And ladies and gentlemen, it can ground our modeling much better. So, you know, we're, we're hoping to be able to use convergent cross mapping to, to recognize some of these uh, connections, hidden Markov modeling to recognize the, the underlying state of the veteran over time hoping to use elements of deep learning combined with hidden Markov modeling and eventually particle filtering to address some of these questions about their, their latent situation um, and to be able to, to predict forward. Uh, for example, to identify risk of recurrence of opioid disorder or opioid use, high risk of short-term substance use or the probability of bonding with their dog that we might anticipate over time. 
we're hoping here to use the dynamic modeling in the form of agent-based modeling and perhaps in the form of a system dynamics model using, uh, using uh, particle filtering as well to probe the underlying situation and ask about interventions, alternative strategies which might improve the situation further, to test out in our models alternative intervention mechanisms which might allow a future such intervention to be more efficacious yet in its gains. So here, when it comes to interventions like the one I started with, I would, or like the service dog one, I would argue that we can gain mightily from our use of rich data sources, data from Fitbits, data from smartphones, data from, from uh, the, the beacon on the dogs, to illuminate the pathways to effect. If we were imagining a moving to opportunity study now, you could imagine running that and not needing to speculate on which pathways were most effective. So we see the outcomes in terms of obesity levels. And rather than speculating as to just how much individuals were out at night on the sidewalks because of enhanced perceived safety um, or, or during the day in terms of walkability in the old neighborhood or the, versus the new one, or without speculating about how much they were going and making use of the food markets in their new, their new uh, areas rather than the convenience stores in a way that contributes to healthiness of diet, or the degree to which they were spending, the girls were spending time at home versus eating out. Rather than speculating about those on the basis of occasional and very fraught self-reports, we can actually measure these things. We can measure physical activity. We can ask taking photos of diet for, for certain types of periods of the food they're eating. We can measure the, the degree to which they are making use of food stores and their perceived safety on a finer grain basis once a day. We can see the degree to which they are making use of the, the infrastructure and the new environment, how much sedentary behavior, how much moderate to vigorous physical activity they're getting, how much time they're spending at home. And we can check if the boys really are going back to the old hood outside of parental supervision and spending a lot more time there than the girls, which was hypothesized. In short, ladies and gentlemen, in a world where we need so keenly to arrive at effective intervention strategies. And to, when we have an intervention that is not successful, to know why it wasn't so we can do one better the next time. So we can, we can work to improve why it fell short, work to explain why some people didn't benefit while others did. The sort of technologies, the sort of inferencing strategies that we're talking about Coupling things with dynamic models, coupling things with machine learning, coupling things with rich data across, that can correct, connect things, collect data across multiple pathways and relate it to dynamic models, say to agent-based models, which depict things across multiple pathways, which can depict this richness of underlying situation and can be corrected in its depiction using incoming data. I believe there's great prospects here, particularly when we combine them with tools such as particle filtering, CCM, hidden Markov modeling, and others. I believe there's great prospects for sharpening our understanding of how we can do better with interventions. And doing so in a way that's true to the fact of multiple pathways to affect that, that forms such a big element of critical realist thinking on effects of interventions, of, of understanding not just is an intervention effective or not, but under what conditions it's effective, under what context it's effective, and due to what mechanisms it's effective so that we can design more effective interventions yet. That's the prospect that I think lies before us with these tools. We need measurement tools that are responsive to it. We need 
an analytic tools that are responsive to it, and a conceptualization of the interventions from a system science perspective that can point to their different pathways to effect so that we can reason about them in our, and, and support that in our study design and in our modeling, okay? So this is one study, it's currently underway. We have very, very, very encouraging study adherence. The degree to which individuals are answering the questionnaires is very encouraging. With the, with the Bluetooth beacons being placed with the dogs, the ability to track that interface and compare it with sleep, for example, um, is the basis of some early analysis. I hope this has given you a bit of a picture of the way some of these tools and technologies can be used for particular interventions and be used to sharpen our thinking about that intervention, not as a course, did it succeed or not, or how much did it succeed, but why it succeeded, and by extension, under what context it might succeed more, okay? So that's one lecture I wanted to give on some ongoing work. Any questions that I could answer about that? this general picture of using these tools to pin down our understanding of multiple pathways. Pathways which these tools can pick up. Unlike traditional instruments, we can, in a low burden way, pick up a lot of these things without even bothering the person, record things like how much physical activity they're getting, record aspects of the structure of their life in terms of mobility predictability with heart rate, pick up how much time they're spending with their own without even troubling them. And yet we can do that in a way that maps very directly to what we might depict in an agent-based model in terms of the different pathways. We can help us learn from that model. Any questions? Yes? Thanks for the still that I'm not yet mm. Mm. Uh, for example, uh, I'm not sure how we uh, quantify the structure in life. The, the structure, oh, okay, glad to, glad to do that. So we actually have uh, a variety of published articles on that topic um, where uh, we have introduced a uh, measure and applied that measure. And actually, it's, it's an adapted measure um, that, uh, that others have applied as well. Uh, we've applied it, we've studied um, uh, the results that it offers at different levels of aggregation and analysis. And uh, it specifically has to do with predictability and entropy measures, particularly entropy rate is its formal characterization. Um, we have uh, papers published, um, I think about three or four of them now, which basically apply entropy as a measure, which, uh, which at its base relates to predictability, okay, predictability of patterns. We've applied it predominantly within the context of mobility entropy. So, how do people move around? What's the predictability of their daily activity space? To what degree are they entropic in the sense of having very little rhyme or reason for where they spend in a day? Think about a homeless person who couch surfs from one home to the other, doesn't know where they're gonna sleep that night. That's one extreme of unpredictability, of extreme of of uh, uncertainty in where they're going to sleep. The other extreme is a shut-in who doesn't move at all, who stays in their home at all times and has an unhealthily low entropy. And then there's a balance between them where there's some degree of, of, of predictability but some degree of variability within the life, the sort of a healthy, healthy region. And we've applied this to, um, gosh, 
data from maybe 10 different studies um, and, and looked at how these measures differ when they're applied at, uh, using data from different uh, frequencies of sampling, time-wise, and different aggregation measures, in other words, based on how accurate the, um, the, the geographic uh, measurements are. Um, and that's shown to be a very effective, versatile, and um, powerful tool in quantifying predictability. Um, it's not the only one. One, one needn't look only at mobility predictability. Um, one could argue that maybe predictability in timing of sleep, for example, is important, or length of sleep, um, uh, or, or uh, predictability in terms of um, an individual's contact patterns. But the fundamental thing, this idea of structure in life, we can arrive at some proxies using published methods, um, predictability amongst uh, being a, a primary one, but not the only one, which can help us reason some about disorder and order in people's lives. And when, when I put that down, that's one of the prime things I had in mind, because one of the things we do hear about the effects of a dog on someone's life is that it can introduce um, uh, greater structure and predictability. There's a certain, uh, a veteran who might have been out at all hours and, you know, um, engaged in um, going to and fro without a, a clear sense of sort of a stable center in their life. Suddenly, they're at home with an animal to care for that they need to spend time with, and there's a certain rhythm that develops that I understand to be somewhat therapeutic when it comes to the effects of a dog. So, so um, that's what I meant. I, I actually do believe that we have some uh, measures that can can aid with that. Is that helpful, comment? Glad to, glad to. Um, yes, Paul. So, so looking at this from purely statistical perspective, yeah. one would be tempted to do structural equation. Mm. 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 So, what what would be the limitations to such an approach? That's a great question. Structural equation modeling is one that I find uh, uh, in the statistical canon, it's very uh, attractive and it can be used in the context of um, many of these, uh, these networks, these, these pathways to affect um, in very powerful ways. Um, I believe in the context of reciprocal causality, in the context of where A can lead to B, B to C, let's say, and C back to A, there are some, and I, and I, I can't remember uh, with SEM compared to some other path an analytic techniques, but I don't think SEM is normally used with, uh, with circular causality. And that is something that can apply here. So a sense of well-being, for example, can, can affect sleep. But it's, uh, so, so a, a person who's, um, who's struggling with um, difficult thoughts, um, thoughts related to perhaps traumatic events in the past, that can lead to lower sleep. But lower sleep can also worsen uh, a sense of well-being and potentially leave them open to these difficult thoughts. So when you have these sort of circular causalities, and this is not the only one, for example, the sense of alienation and sense of well-being, there's, there's elements, there's others shown up, up here as well, desire to give back and so on. Um, so uh, structural equation modeling, uh, as best uh, I understand how to apply it, um, has challenges when dealing with this reciprocal causality. Now let me be very clear, be very, I think it's actually a very good step to undertake with such, such elements, but I think there's certain needs that lie beyond its purview where uh, system science methods uh, that capture causality, that's uh, excuse me, reciprocal causality, capture feedbacks, which are at the heart of, say, system dynamics, and uh, which are very important to agent-based modeling as well. Um, that can be useful for broad areas of this which do exhibit reciprocal causality, um, <coughs> many of which are shown here with these, um, with these loops, if that's helpful. So I think 
I think I would encourage SEM's use uh, within this context for portions of this, for elements of this. It will be one of the, the tools of choice, but I think for other questions that involve the broader system, you will want to also use some system science methods. Yeah, if that's helpful. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. That's a great question, and um, one that uh, uh, I, I, I've heard remarked by other uh, other scientists who are also involved in system science, uh, and it it is I think a, a very good idea to apply in that context. Additional questions. Additional questions related to this. Yes, Tim. Um, I got, so, like, this is the system that we call one uh, veteran or mm. veteran. Good question. I showed it to depict it for one veteran because I, I actually, and let, let's put it this way. Generally with models, we, we have a structure that might apply to multiple context, but any one instantiation of that, particular values for things, um, uh, are going to be different from veteran to veteran uh, in this case. And, and so I think, you know, this overall theory, as it were, which we could then capture, say, in an agent-based model, that o overall theory um, uh, could, could apply to different veterans, but the details of it would be different. The details of its, of, of the degree, for example, to which uh, a certain veteran engages outside the home and in moderate to vigorous physical activity with the dog will be different. Some individuals may elect to go running with their dog or to play frisbee with their dog in a very vigorous way. Other individuals, um, perhaps because of the nature of the dog, I mean, this is a program where I think some people involved have, uh, have, you know, black labs or white labs. Others have the Labrador uh, retrievers. Others have chihuahuas. Um, and, you know, I probably wouldn't go running with a chihuahua. Um, I guess I could. But it, would, it, would be, it, would a, um, it, it might be a difficult experience. I guess I could hold it, right? Um, uh, but the point is that for particular veterans, who choose per or are paired with particular dogs, and also because of personal circumstance. Like a veteran who's an amputee might not be able to engage in much, uh, very vigorous physical activity because they're missing, they're working with a prosthetic limb and it's much harder for them to engage in vigorous physical activity or someone in a wheelchair who's you know, paraplegic or what have you. Um, so I would say that particular instantiations of this will differ and you know if I were to think about Paul's suggestion the factor loadings associated with different linkages here you know certain certain uh, certain of these linkages will be stronger for some individuals with uh, compared to other individuals and maybe there are some people already have a lot of structure in their life because they have kids at home and so on and this dog is not going to materially um, raise that or, or not not in a big way so in short I think that that um, this basic rubric could be applied to many veterans to good effect and so it is with most of our models right um, the models that Andrew builds uh, of, of suicide uh, in the Australian context we can take to Canada but we need to adapt them in their particulars we need to adapt the particular parameters and the particulars of the empirical data that are used for that, the particulars of the initial state of the model. And so uh, it's not to say you can't get tremendous benefit from reuse, but it's not a, you know, it's not a plug and play where you just take it and you stick it down and say, let it be Canada. And, you know, uh, the chorus breaks out, um, oh, Canada, and, and you know, snowfalls. Um, it's it's not like that at all. Um, uh, if only s uh, six white boomers would deliver our models, but um, but 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 not yet. So, um, so long answer to a short question, but uh, but yeah, it it would need to be adapted in its particulars to each veteran. But I hope this could, you know, it could be a step towards a theory 
that would start to hold greater and greater water for what's going on. I've no doubt that three years from now, I'll consider this diagram a crude, a crude, you know, impoverished cipher compared to what the theory that emerges. But um, but it needs to, uh, you need to start somewhere. You, you take a stance, you learn, you build models to learn faster, you build, you, you invest in these tools to learn faster, and that's a human, uh, you know, it, it takes humility, it builds, it, it builds um, knowledge, but it takes humility to start. And this is, I think, a, a first, first start at starting to theorize what might be going on in a way that we could falsify with data, we could challenge with data, way we could adapt on a per, um, uh, you know, per individual basis uh, and learn how to do better. Okay, other questions? This highlights you know, several themes here. Big data is, is such a good match with models because both depict things, can depict things at the causal pathway level. It's one of the big reasons they're so compatible. System science models and data. Data science methods can help tie these models down to evidence and is needed to make sense of that evidence in terms of the conclusions. And, and um, the types of methods we're talking about this week rightly belong in the toolbox that also dignifies tr more traditional instruments, whether it's you know regression type approaches for things, some things, or more contemporary methods yet, like uh, structural equation models. All very important components to work together to address these puzzles. But, but this general picture of, of a world where we can better learn from interventions. We can better learn from evidence. We can better theorize on the basis of that evidence. Is one of the foremost sort of motivators for, for the thinking that goes into this boot camp. Okay? Any, any final questions with that? Okay. Well, I'm honored to have you uh, listen, uh, listen to that. It's a very exciting study. It will be going on for quite some time. It's, I'm really excited by how well it's going, how well the veterans are responding, and by uh, looks at the early data that, that we're getting out.